Welcome. I'm your host, Vince Pacenti. Today, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence's darling, ChatGPT. Now, ChatGPT has been around for a number of months, but really understanding what it means. Does this new technology mean that eventually robots are going to take over the world? Or does it mean it's going to help enrich our lives? There's ethical issues involved. Are there jobs being replaced? And so for us to understand ChatGPT, we have four guests. Two of those are with us in the studio today. Diana Boer. Diana Boer is an author of 50 books, Executive Presence and Being Able to Have Communication Strategies. Fascinating uh, materials you put out, and I'm really interested to what you have to say about artificial intelligence. We also have Yoram Solomon. Yoram is a, um, I call you a geek, actually, <laughs> but you've been on the front end of technology. You have a background when it comes to being in the front end of USB and Wi-Fi. You're an adjunct professor at SMU Cox School of Business and an author. Remote, we have with us Terry Brock. Terry Brock has spent 40 years interpreting what technology means to us, especially new technology. And we also have Gina Carr. Gina Carr helps executives and business people get clarified of where they're headed with their business and what they want to accomplish. So thank you all for being our guests here on Perspectives Matter. Let's start with Terry Brock. Now, Terry, you're going to lead us on here. What is ChatGPT? What does it mean to us? And describe what this tool is. Well, Vince, when you think about it, ChatGPT is a real revolutionary tool that's unlike anything we've seen before. Matter of fact, it really is a natural language processing tool, and it's driven by AI technology. That gives you the ability to have a human-like conversation. Yeah, that's really important. A human-like conversation with much more um, than a chatbot. You're getting all kinds of information that we wouldn't normally have from just a computer, say a Google search that we're used to. This takes it to the next level, and it does a lot for us. Matter of fact, what it is, it's a generative pre-trained transformer. That's what the GPT stands for. And you might think, well, what in the world does that mean, Terry? <laughs> generative means it's coming up with something brand new. It's creating, generating it. And these are pre-trained. That means you're putting in information that is telling it, this is what I want with this. This is how I do this. Here's how I do that. For instance, sometimes you put a, a prompt in telling chat GPT, think like you are a medical doctor. Think like you are a lawyer with trademarks. And then it starts thinking that way. It's pre-trained. And then it is a transformer, meaning that it takes what's there and it changes it enough so that you're getting useful, valuable information. Okay, uh, Yoram, I'm going to switch over to you. I'm really curious about your interpretation of what chat GPT means to our world in terms of, well, let's come at it from a university professor standpoint. What are you seeing? Well, uh, I see what we saw with every technology that got in. First, I have to, to say that I'm, I'm not projecting here the university's position. Uh, this, these positions are my own. And most universities actually don't have a position on ChatGPT yet. And for the most part, professors would uh, just try to ban it. But that's what we've done with every technology until now. Before ChatGPT, it was Google, it was Wikipedia, it was the internet, the computer, the calculator. Uh, it's gonna take a while, but it's really a tool that helps and gives shortcuts. So I'm in favor. You're in favor. Okay, let's talk about this for a second because we understand that uh, Facebook took and Instagram took months to get up to a million users. Uh, Netflix Netflix took three and a half years to become uh, reach that one million subscribers. Chat GPT took five days to hit that mark. What's your take on that? I think there, there are several uh, factors that played in. Uh, one is every new technology just takes shorter and shorter and shorter to get adopted. Uh, first, because you have tools like Facebook and Instagram that lets you know what's coming. But, but I think that there is uh, there's obviously the element of uh, it's really, really cool. You know, it's a cool technology. It's uh, the computer finally talks to you, talks to you back, gives, gives you answers and, and sounds like a computer. But I think it's also a matter of timing. I think that we haven't seen anything big come out of technology. We just came out of two years of a pandemic. 
Uh, and then as soon as we came out, Russia invaded Ukraine. We needed something. And I think people are latching on to this. There's this new thing and we need to have it. All right. So, Gina, I'm going to switch over to you because you've got your finger on the pulse of what's happening in the corporate landscape. How do you see this impacting the corporate world and the executives you work with? Well, certainly there are a lot of jobs that will go away where artificial intelligence can come in and replace different people. But those people can will then be able to be the ones to use the tools and manage the tools and manage the way the tools are, are being used and amplified. For example, many years ago, I worked for General Electric when they first introduced robots to the assembly line. And so a lot of people did lose or change their jobs. But those were jobs that people didn't really like to do anyway. It was heavy. It was noisy. It was dangerous. And so people came in. Uh, the robots came in and did things to make their lives better. I'm going to switch over to Diana because you're sitting very quiet here, but you have written 50 books and you even coach people on writing books, me being one of them. <laughs> and so really, I, I'm very curious your perspective as an author, ChatGPT and the siren call of having something write something for you in seconds versus being the source of that information. Well, it's very tempting. <laughs> I'll have to say that because it is efficient. And I've used uh, the AI for images and marketing and that kind of thing. But I think as long as your work as an author requires creativity, mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to be replaced. I think that there are really three issues that authors deal with. And one is just the legality of it. You, you may put in a question for an answer, but you don't know where that answer came from. So it, it could be even just a word. I'm thinking a friend of mine who had reverse deja vu to vuja day. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's for him. He created that, but it's, you know, it's out there somewhere and someone may try to use that as they're writing a book and not realizing that somebody else created that word. Well, so you don't know where that came from. I'm hearing an artist say, I'm not going to give technology <laughs> this, you know, brush stroke. I'm going to be the source of that right, brush stroke. Right. Ideas are everywhere. It's uh -huh. the ex execution of those ideas that the author brings to the table and they have to think about accuracy i mean that's what we expect of journalists that they look is there a bias built into this question or this answer and so it, it you could we could mislead the whole world really quickly with this mm -hmm. so accuracy is an issue if you don't know where it came from yeah. if you're looking up at a health issue for example and you see it came from mayo clinic that's a lot more credible than it came from abc place right, right. and if you don't know where those answers are coming from you don't know if they're accurate or not and then, of course, what you mentioned a minute ago is the credibility issue. Uh -huh. I mean, this is what you bring to the table, your ideas and how you've styled them. But if you are not, if you're claiming credit for something that a machine turned out, uh -huh. that's a credibility issue. That is an ethics issue. <laughs> ethics. Ethics and, and credibility. And let's, let's dive into that a little bit here. And I'm really, I want to switch over to Terry because, Terry, for 40 years, you've uh, interpreted technology and what similarities are you seeing today? And let's uh, drive in the uh, concept of ethics as well. What this ethics is being questioned right now when you don't know the source and you don't know the accuracy. What's your take? Yeah, I would have to agree with both of my friends. I find that we're seeing so much change right now, it's sometimes overwhelming. But Yoram, I'm going to have to agree with you. It's very much like I remember years ago, they had this little device that you could punch in numbers and it would actually add them and subtract, and then even multiply and divide the calculator. And people said, oh no, we're not gonna have that. And I remember they banned calculators in schools, in some university, you could not have it. Now we look at them and go, no, that's absurd. We just have to get smarter ourselves. And as we get smarter and can embrace it, we'll do better the, to the ethics. That's a very important consideration, but also the AI is gonna help us there because it can then find out is this generated by artificial intelligence or was it a real human being that did it? And it can find that out in the, the manuals, the kind of work that we turn out, we'll be judged by that. So I think it's just a whole new way of doing things. It's kind of like, hey kids, this thing called the internet just came out. Yeah. Vince, I actually, I, I, I agree with Terry, but I see an opportunity. There is an opportunity in moving our thinking up. You know, you asked about school and, uh, can ChatGPT answer a term paper? It depends on what you're asking for. If, if what you're asking your student is to tell me what is already known, yeah, ChatGPT can do that. 
there is an opportunity here to go up and say, what I demand of my students, I demand creative thinking. I demand to see their passion come through. And those things are things that ChatGPT can't do. So to me, if we have a student in a classroom for just about, take a K through 12 student, we have them in the classroom for 16,380 hours. What percentage of that do you want them to spend on doing things that a computer can do? Mm -hmm. You have an opportunity to use those hours to do smarter work for authors like Diana to be created, to be unique, to have your own voice as opposed to the commodity that comes out of ChatGPT. So use it just like you use a computer, just like you use a calculator, just like you use Google or the internet. Differentiate yourself at higher layers. And I like your point about professors having to learn to grade papers differently, not just regurgitate what my lecture was, right. but evaluating them on a totally so different So that the things. student learns rather than, and, did you memorize? Yes, and yeah. taking taking that idea from yeah. authors. I can see authors eventually trusting the their, their inputs to, to right. the chat enough that they would use this if they were writing something pretty generic and they, they need some general principles. Let's say they're doing a book on listening skills mm -hmm. and they say, you know, give me six principles of listening. They would get those generic principles. But the author comes in and says, do I want to use that principle? How could I illustrate it better? Right. Could right. I turn it into an acronym, that creative thing is what's not there yet. Okay, so Gina, I'm gonna switch over to you because I'm really curious about fairly recent news that BuzzFeed lets off, uh, lays off 12% of their employees and says out loud to the, all of the, the marketplace, we're gonna replace them with you know, open AI and their stock goes up. <laughs> so we're seeing a bit of the ethics issue uh, playing out, but also what is this happening? To, what is happening to our workforce? What's your read on that? Well, to, to the ethics issue, it's certainly incumbent upon the leaders of that company to do things that are good for the shareholders. And if reducing the staff through a more efficient means is good for the shareholders, then that is what they should be doing. And this is like so many other power tools that are now at their disposal. It's, it's a tool. The artificial intelligence is a tool which will replace some workers. Now, ideally those workers take their skills and go somewhere else or launch their own venture so that they're now in a capacity that they're, they're using their brain in better ways than writing stock articles that Buzz, BuzzFeed might use. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Diana, you know, we have this technology for writers. Now, instead of just um, authors of books, authors of anything, authors of social media posts, that kind of thing, what are we seeing in your estimation in the future with authors outputting information? Where are we headed there? I, I could see authors using uh, copywriting if they want to describe something, copywriting is pretty generic. I mean, that's the reason they turn out, uh, AI turns out such great copywriting. There's so many things out there they've been trained on in phrasing. Uh, I can see for social media, you make a comment and you think, well, that comes across a little negative. How could I? Mm -hmm. And you put it in chat to, hey, soften the tone. And that's the prompt, soften the tone of this. I could see them changing passive voice to active voice to make it mm -hmm. livelier. Mm -hmm. So I, I could see them using things like that. And even robotic things like major corporations right. that have, uh, you know, redirecting the call. I could see media people when they call you up and say, hey, would you guest on my podcast? Would you be on this TV show? And that goes right to, here's an article and here's the interview questions to ask me and here's my calendar, check it. And so I could see operational things that authors could use that for. Now, Yoram, I see your wheels turning. <laughs> <laughs> now, automating social media. Talk a bit about that because there's, Diana kind of touched on it. Well, if you wanted to change it, you could change it manually. Well, what, what are you seeing? Well, first of all, I think uh, we probably need to acknowledge that per a percentage of social media is already automated. Uh -huh. uh, I, I don't remember what the latest number, if it was 16% of Facebook accounts are actually robots. <laughs> uh, so we're there, we're just not acknowledging it. But uh, again, I, I think if, if I go back to our students spend seven hours a day, 180 days a year, 16,380 years until they graduate from high school. What percentage of that time do we want them to spend on hunting? Well, not much. We, we're going to bring 
food from home and we're going to have electricity and we're going to have the computer and we're, we're going to have the internet and Google. Um, it's to me, it's freeing up time. I, I use tools today that, that are, you know, they're not chat GPT, but they're artificial intelligence. I'm sure you use tools like grammar corrections, you know, Grammarly. And, and so it's one layer up in how you help me write better content, but it frees my time. And every employee that thinks uh, my job is going to be taken away by artificial intelligence, it frees our time to think at the higher level, to create bigger things. It's an opportunity. Okay, well, Terry, I'm gonna lean on you again here. Uh, let's look around the corner into the future. You've seen trends come and go. Uh, what are you seeing around the corner with generative intelligence, automated intelligence? I see it gonna be here for a long time and I think we're gonna see lots of improvements. Matter of fact, one of the things that all of our viewers can use right now that I'm so excited about is you know those books you've written or the books you've wanted to read and you think, gee, I wanna read that someday. I think, what Diane, what, what you have done, and you've written more books than most people have read and I compliment <laughs> you on that. <laughs> so wonderful putting those together. But you know, think of those books that you really would like to read but you just haven't yet. Like for instance, many people want to read War and Peace well, you hear it's about over a thousand pages, so I'm not gonna read that right away. But what you can do with ChatGPT, and I really, literally did this, I asked it to condense War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy into five paragraphs and put it in the language that a 10-year-old would understand. That was literally what I typed, that's called the prompt. And it came back with an exact determination of what it was. Think about those books you've been wanting to read those articles that are too long, didn't read? Well, what you can do is you can take those, put that into ChatGPT and start getting a better understanding of some of the classics and other very important information. So I think the future is gonna be bright if we manage it the proper way. But, but Terry, that's going to cut into my royalty check if all those people <laughs> have those books summarized out there rather than buying them. You're absolutely right. And the thing is, unfortunately, like the workers you talked about at BuzzFeed events, they're laid off and we feel for them. But we had to lay off a lot of farmers when tractors came out because the tractors do more than the farmers can with oxen and with mules. So we have to keep changing and shifting throughout history. That means, OK, Diana, someone with your brilliance who has written 50 books and written a whole lot more in articles and help people, you'll be able to do even more because of tools like ChatGPT. And we don't even know what it is yet any more than we knew about what the internet was gonna do when it came out in the early 90s. But I'd say, folks, fasten your seatbelts, get ready for a fun ride ahead. Let's get back to ethics here for a second because I want us all to kind of chime in on this for a second. And I have a little story where my daughter, still in college, and she wrote an essay on ChatGPT, submitted it. Within seconds, felt guilty. Goes back to the professor and says, may I resubmit this? I don't feel it's really in my voice. She couldn't cough up that she had written it <laughs> or ChatGPT had written it in seconds. I think it starts with our attitude that ChatGPT is bad. And, and we had that same attitude with every technology. I remember being on the early days of the technology that we called Wi-Fi, and there was no IT manager that would deploy it. I mean, everybody was against it. Because we look at ChatGPT as something bad, uh, then when we use it, we don't want to admit to it. But I think that if we embrace that a technology like ChatGPT is a good thing, it's a shortcut, it allows us to work at higher layers, then all we have to do is, oh, this part was done by ChatGPT no ethical issue anymore. I'm not claiming authorship of something that I didn't write. Right. I, I'm just accepting that that's part of uh, writing a book. I, I'm, I'm thinking about Diana writing 50 books in uh, how many years have you done that? A, a, zil a, a few. Zillion. <laughs> so <laughs> All these your wrinkles next 50 here, you books, see that. <laughs> Your next 50 books, you're going to write in two years because you're going to think at the higher, bigger layer, bigger picture ideas. And then you're going to use a tool like ChatGPT to add the content and the glue inside. <laughs> you know, and I think what what you're saying, I agree with, and it comes down, in my opinion, to your personal standards of integrity. Just right. like if I took this away from AI and you're sitting in a meeting, you've had bosses that go in and say, well, I think, 
and their staff really came up with that idea and they claim it mm -hmm. and we don't like it there and I don't think we're going to like it in a book I don't think we're going to like it in a blog article that the author put his name on there or her name on there and then it's really not theirs and you see that paragraph written somewhere else or those two sentences or that turn of phrase somewhere else so I think it all comes down to your personal integrity about claiming it what you claim what you let people know is not yours right and Gina, what about the corporate perspective? I mean, to collaborate with a tool to increase profitability is a goal. Uh, in the same breath, we've got integrity and ethics as part of this play. How, what is on, resting on the shoulders of the corporate landscape you feel right now? Well, I think in so many professions, it, at some point in the near future, it would be almost malpractice to not have an AI assistant helping you to formulate what you're doing and, and it increases the productivity so much of what they're doing. I think back to pre-automatic spreadsheets, before spreadsheets were on the computer, there were spreadsheets, uh, accountants did spreadsheets and different financial people use spreadsheets. But then as soon as they were automated and on the computer and easy to, and super easy to use, people didn't say, oh, I used a spread, I, I used a computer for this spreadsheet instead of doing it by hand the way that they used to do it it's seen as smart use of a power tool that equips you and helps you do your job better. And I think at all levels of the corporate, corporate hierarchy, it's just going to be the assumption that, okay, yeah, they used, uh, they used artificial intelligence to help organize, structure their thoughts and put their material out there with their additions. Terry, uh, put on your coaching hat and uh... There's somebody out there, I can't imagine, who hasn't heard about ChatGPT, but maybe hasn't tried it yet. What kind of advice would you give them to try these new technologies? And instead of, you know, some people think of it playing with it as a waste of time. How would you frame this? Oh, I think playing with it would be a great way to learn. It's how we learn many things. And I would agree with Yoram on this as well. We got to, instead of thinking of it as bad, look at the opportunities, see what's out there and what you can do with it. The kind of opportunities, when you first see it, if you haven't seen it before, they're going to be jaw dropping. You're going to be going, oh my goodness, it can do that? Well, yes, it can. And we want to get to know that and understand what good can we get from that. Like I mentioned, getting condensation, developing your own cliff notes out of books, out of many things, also for translation. It's really good. The other day what I did is I wanted to get the words to the Russian national anthem, because I speak a little Russian. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to see that in English and in Russian. So I just asked ChatGPT to do that. And sure enough, it gave it to me in English, then in Russian, so that I can use that and be able to use that as a learning tool. And I think when we can say, hey, this is great for learning a lot of different tools, a lot of different kinds of subject matter that we didn't before, I'd say we got something really good and we've got a wonderful future ahead for it. Thank you, Terry. Well, I'm going to turn to our guests here and ask you to summarize each of you just kind of where you think we're at with artificial intelligence from your perspective, your expertise, and um, give us an idea of what's on your mind. I think you have to think of the three things. Legality is this plagiarism. Am I, somebody's got to come after me because you don't know where it came. You have mm -hmm. to think of accuracy and you have to think of the ethics of it. And I would summarize by saying if you're going to write a book on how to do an audit in your company, use use AI. It could come up with the, the, the steps of doing something. But if you want creativity and a unique book and a unique product, that's where your own creativity comes in. Great. Uh, Gina, why don't we go to you next? What are your s summations here? Yes, I think we need to look at this as many other tools that have come along and really been disruptive in our world. Uh, we may not like it. We may, may be afraid of it. We may think that, oh, this is going to replace jobs. This is going to harm me in some way. But I, I encourage people to really embrace it. It is part of the new world. It is going to make your life better. And in just a few years, you're going to say, how did I ever live without it? And Gina, one additional thing. What do you think people are fearing right now uh, by holding themselves back from it? Well, there's the fear that it is going to capture your intellectual property and that you no longer have own your intellectual property for those of us who are, who are creatives. There's the fear that it's somehow an additional more serious la layer of uh, privacy invasion and security invasion because it's artificial intelligence and certain forms of artificial intelligence probably will, will be that. 
And that's just something that we've had to adjust to with social media, with our phones, all of the tracking that's already being done. We have to adjust that there's a new layer of that coming with artificial intelligence. You know, Vince, there's one more thing that, that we're afraid of. I'm sure that uh, Gina will agree. And that's we just haven't spent enough time with it. And the people who are most afraid of something are the people who have not spent time with it. I mean, would you be willing to sit in the back seat of a self-driving car? By the way, another uh, artificial <laughs> right. intelligence uh, element. Uh, would you be willing to sit in the back seat when nobody's sitting in the front? The answer probably now is no. And probably three three years down the road, once you did have that technology. Uh, would be yes, because you have enough experience and it's just working. Chat GPT, people, or, or artificial intelligence in different manifestations, people just haven't used it long enough, so they're afraid of the unknown. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, Terry, speaking of the unknown, you're, you're the one with the crystal ball to bring us home. Give us an idea of the summary comments around Chat GPT, artificial intelligence, and the future. Well, I think for the future, we're looking at a lot of options that are going to be good, but also there's going to be negatives. Watch for the news stories that come out and say bad thing just happened because of not just chat GPT, but because of one thing we haven't even talked about yet, voice technology, where I can mimic your voice. And as I talk, you see me speaking, but it's coming out sounding just like Vince Pacente. And you think, whoa, that could be really bad. Well, those are things we're going to need to address and understand how to deal with it. So I would say don't cower from this conquer it. Find out what you can do, study it, learn what's there, learn the good that we can use it for, as well as be aware of where it can be harmful, both from an ethical point of view and harming people in a real world situation. But I think if we arm ourselves with the right knowledge, we'll be able to handle it. All right. Well, thank you all for participating in this program. Yoram, do you have any summation comments? You got two sentences? I would just say the Gartner hype cycle. Right now, it's at the peak of the hype of uh, expected, uh, hype of uh, peak of expect expectations. Uh, it's going to go through the trough of disillusionment at some point until we figure out what can we use it for, and that's when it's going to reach the plateau of productivity. All right. Well, thank you both here in the studio, and thank you for joining us, all four of you, for diving into a topic that's massive. We had three hours. We still probably couldn't get through it all. So thank you for your time. Sure. And for our viewers, thank you for joining us. We are, as always, we bring you different perspectives on things that matter with people who care.